it was a Friday night, and you would have never believed Pastor Brad's face. It was a night that he had got the realization that he was called to plant a church. And usually Brad, if you know Brad, he's, he's pretty expressive, usually always smiling. And when I, Brad came, he goes, I've got to talk to you. And it's like, did somebody, like what happened? Did somebody die? Is, is Sean okay? Your kids? It was like, I've got to plant a church. And it was just this, like something just happened to me. Can we talk? And that was the first time that we began to talk about Manifest. And what's exciting for me is that was three years ago. And the reality is what I do is I help start churches in Alberta and come alongside guys like Brad that says, I've been called to plant a church. And, and what we don't, I don't recruit. I don't plant churches, but I believe that Jesus tells church planters, I want you to go do this, and they follow him and do it. And so it, it's exciting to be here because this was just something that God's doing. It's nothing that I've done or Brad's done. It's just Jesus is doing it through people. And so uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to see so many new people. Um, I've been here a number of times, and there's people that I've never seen before, so it's good to be here. Let me uh, pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we come before you, and we praise you because you are a good God. You are the God that loves us, and you are the God that initiates relationship with us. You've given us your word to know how for us to live so we can have a relationship with you so we know who you are and how we can respond to you. So we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're a personal God. Jesus, we thank you that you came to this earth and you lived a perfect life, a life that we could not live, and then you, you died a death in our place on our behalf. And Holy Spirit, you rose Jesus from the dead, and we praise you for that. And we pray for that spirit now to teach us as we open your word, Father. And so we pray and thank you for each person that's here. May you help me as I express um, the thoughts that you've given me from your word. So Jesus, uh, may you be honored and glorified here this morning in your name. Amen. Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about some awkward moments. And I don't know if you've ever had awkward moments at a dinner table. Anyone ever have awkward moments where somebody said something, you go, oh, they shouldn't have said that. Maybe it's when, you know, a family gathering, a wedding, um, or like one of your weird cousins. And I know none of us are the weird cousins, but you, everyone has those weird cousins or that weird uncle that shows up and they say things, or maybe they, they drink too much and they say things they shouldn't say. Um, somebody's laughing there. Maybe that was you. But, um, but the reality is we, we've had those moments. Um, and sometimes I've uh, had the opportunity to MC weddings. And it's the weirdest thing at a wedding when someone gets up and they shouldn't be saying things that they're saying in front of all of these people. And because usually there's a diverse group of people. Um, and I, I had this one, I was, person was up there and I'm like, should I like cut this guy off or what? Because this is going really bad. Um, and many of you have probably experienced times like that. It's like, okay, this guy should just shut up. And, and hopefully that's not one of them right now. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it won't be. Um, but this is kind of what, what happened. And I want to set the scene for what was happening in, in the text that we're going to look at today. And not that Jesus was that awkward person saying inappropriate things. Jesus was saying things that needed to be said that everyone was scared to say. And see, sometimes people have this idea of Jesus, that he was this guy that was really passive, that walked around in a dress and was just really nice to people. And, and Jesus was really nice to people who were lost, who needed him, who needed his help, and says, I need help. But for the people that, that were steeped in religion, steeped in their own ways of doing things, he would speak the truth. And sometimes when we speak the truth, it doesn't go over well. So this morning, we're going to look at a dinner party that Jesus was invited to, and we're going to look at some awkward moments that happened there. And those awkward moments, I believe, each led to a lesson. And so there's five lessons that we're going to learn this morning about what Jesus was teaching about the mission. Now, we all understand mission. 
If you've ever, uh, you know, if you grew up like in the 70s like I did, we always, you know, the, the missions that we would, you know, it was always the, uh, the missions, the Apollo missions, and it was the missions to the moon. And, and then if you've, if you've grown up and you liked Mission Impossible, uh, Tom Cruise would get the glasses. And, you know, if you choose to accept your mission, your, these glasses will destruct. And, and so we, we, we would understand mission. A mission is something that we're called to do. And, and that's what I believe that, that we want, I want to talk to you this morning about a mission that, that Jesus called the people that he was there with and, and calling us this morning on. And it happened through some awkward moments. So if you want to turn your, if you have a Bible or an app, uh, turn to Luke 14. Uh, it's about two-thirds of the way through your Bible to the right um, in the New Testament and if you're just brand new at this, I'm so glad that you're here. And even if you're here and you don't even believe that, that there's a God yet, but someone brought you here or, or you, you, know, you just really like Brad, so you're, you're here, um, there's things here, even if you don't believe God, that there's things that you can take away and use tomorrow or this week or use in your family this week because the stuff that Jesus says is truth and it's, it's golden. And so let's, let's look at, we're going we're gonna to break this up into four parts. So it's, it's again, Jesus has been invited to this this dinner party, and this is what happens. I'm going to start reading verse 1. One Sabbath, and that would be the Saturday, which the Jews sense was a day that you do no work, and he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. They were watching him carefully, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. So it's the Sabbath, the ruler of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were the people that were the religious leaders of the day. They didn't like Jesus because Jesus kind of did things to, this, to them like this all the time, called them out on their stuff where they were wrong. And they couldn't, they were trying to trap him. And so they're having this dinner party, which they kind of invited all their friends, and they invited a man who's there with dropsy. Now, dropsy is a, is a disease that would cause parts of the body to swell, and it usually stemmed from a liver or a heart or a kidney disease. And so this person would have normally been asked to come to this party, but it looks like they set Jesus up because they were trying to trick him. So they set this up, and they go, okay, you know what? We're get, we've got Jesus because we know what Jesus does. He heals people. He makes things better. And so they were there in, in verse 3, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And they go, well, they're kind of thinking, now, if Jesus says no, then, then he's not the nice guy that everybody thinks he is. And if he says yes, then he's breaking the Mosaic law. And we've, we've got him. So we, we've got him tricked. But they remain silent. And what would happen in, the, in these conversations if, if someone would remain silent in one of these dialogues, it meant that either they didn't know the law as well as the other person did or that they were wrong. So that's what happened, but it, there was silence. Let's, let's look what happens. Then he took him and healed him. Of course, Jesus healed him. Yeah, just healed him. And then he sent him away so he wouldn't be part of what was going on and to see what was going on, I think. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So, awkward moment. Trying to trick Jesus, and Jesus says, no, uh, what would happen? Would you, guys, would you guys actually pull, and these Pharisees would actually believe that they would pull something out. But they didn't believe that this person should be healed. See, they were trying to figure out what God would do. See, the first lesson that we have here is lesson one, and it's compassion. You see, they thought that God so wanted them to, to obey the law that they wouldn't lift a finger and help a person on a day when they weren't supposed to work. You see, they were kind of going, okay, what would God want us to do? He'd want us to keep the Sabbath, so therefore we won't hurt, help this person. And Jesus came to show us what God was like. And he showed us that God was a God full of compassion. Compassion for people who are hurting. Compassion for people who are at their ends, the limit of their life, who have no hope. He has compassion on those people. 
And I'm not sure, like I said, if, if there's, a, I know there's new people to that that are trying to understand God here, and that is awesome. And so if you're here and you've got a view that God is this, this, this God that wants to hurt people and wants to just keep the rules, the story tells us that God is a God of compassion. And maybe some of your thinking of how, how you've thought of God in the past is this harsh, unliving God is that he's actually very compassionate. And Jesus shows us. That's the first that we learn here in the school of mission. It says, but they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. See, Jesus has compassion. And I'm not sure where you're at today, whether you need physical healing, whether you need emotional healing, or whether you need just some other healing in your life that you're broken. God is a God of compassion. God initiates that with you. And maybe even you here, being here today, he's initiated and said, come, I want you to hear some, some news. I want, to hear, I want you to hear that I'm a compassionate God. So that's the first lesson, that God is compassionate. The second that we learn of, of Jesus' school of mission is this. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. And now he told a parable to those who were invited. And when he noticed that they chose places of honor, saying to them, okay, again, here comes an awkward moment again. So first awkward moment, heals the guy who really needs healing. Then they're sitting around, and, and Jesus goes, I, I, I noticed how you all chose the places where you're going to sit. And it was very important in those days of where people actually sat. Because the closer you are to the person, the, the guest of honor and the, and the host, the more important you are. And so Jesus probably noticed these people. They came in, they rushed in, and they grabbed seats for themselves that were the best seats. And Jesus begins to speak. He says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do you not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you would be invited by him? And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted." You see, that's those Pharisees back in those days. That's people 2,000 years ago. We never put ourselves first, do we? We're always doing that. We always want to be first, get in line first. We, we, we want to put ourselves first. Why? Because if, if I don't put myself first, who will? And the reason why I want to tell you this morning is why you don't have to put yourself first is because Jesus put himself behind you so you could go before you. And that is a great, great um, truth, what Jesus did for us. But you just have to, have to realize that um, in Calgary, like I'm new to Calgary, so I've been here four years almost, and the drivers here are nuts. Like, why do drivers speed up when you put your single light on? I was in BC this week. They don't do it there. But here they do it. I'm just like, what the heck? What's, where are you going to? You're unemployed anyways. Like I could see a, two years ago, everyone was employed, but you're, you're unemployed, you're going to get laid off, so what's the hurry? Slow down. Enjoy the beautiful country that we live in. But that's just kind of a microcosm of actually how we live. We're always trying to put ourselves forward. And so if you're here today and you don't even believe God, this is something you could use tomorrow. It's like, you know what, I'm going to let somebody go ahead of me. When you're in Starbucks tomorrow, pray for the person behind you or let someone go ahead of you. Open the door for them. You feel good when you do stuff like that. So it's a win. People like you when you do stuff like that. So it's a win. Even if you don't understand the spiritual significance behind it. And so this morning, if, if you're one that's, that's pushed yourself to the front, why do you push yourself to the front? You see, the, the good news is that we, we don't have to. It doesn't matter where we sit. If, if our identity is only in our position, then we will be always disappointed and discouraged. Like if you would go to a wedding, and, 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 and this is kind of the example that Jesus used, if you go to a wedding and you go and sit at the head table, and you're not at the head table, it would be a little awkward. Um, you're not the maid of honor. You should go sit over there. 
and you end up getting, and, and if you've listened, watched The Wedding Singer, you know, you're supposed to be at table nine. A couple people have seen Wedding Singer. That was where the mutants would sit, table nine. Um, and so the reality is, is Jesus is saying, you, you don't have to push yourself forward. You don't have to do that. You see, and when this is going to happen, and what I love to see when I come to manifest is, is that new faces and it's growing. And sometimes as it grows, what's going to happen, what's natural, what happens, is you're not going to have the same access to Pastor Brad and Shauna or to some of the other leaders in the church. And you go, man, I, I used to, I remember those times when we, could, we were so close. And the reality is manifest grows, and I really believe that manifest is going to grow that this church will not remain this size. And some, some of you go, man, I really like it this way. I really like it. I don't, I've got Brad's phone number. I could call Pastor Brad. He's always there, and he's willing to take me to Tim Hortons or Starbucks to have coffee. Or to, they're all, but that may change as it grows. And some of you go, man, I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm significant enough. And what I want to say to you is, is don't let the enemy tell you that you're not significant or the, the role that you play doesn't matter. That's just not the truth. Because as, as you serve, you don't, need, you don't need anybody to say, good job, you don't need anybody. Why? Because Jesus says in the end, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So as you work behind the scenes, as you don't have to put yourself forward, say, look at me, look at me. Why? Because we follow the example of Jesus who, who came to this earth from heaven and humbled himself, taking the form of a servant. And even a person who was without sin did not deserve the cross that we, that, that, what we celebrated at Easter time. Didn't deserve that, but yet took it. Why? For us. So why can you put others first? Because Jesus put you first before himself. That's an example that we have, which is just absolutely unbelievable. Third awkward moment. third awkward moment in the school of mission. Let's keep reading verse 12. He also, he said also to the man who had invited him, so um, the man who invited him, so now he goes, they sit down, he goes, the man said this, he says, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do you not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest also invite you in return and you be repaid? So Jesus sits down with this guy after and he goes, I noticed that you, uh, you invited all the people that can repay you. I, I noticed you invited all the people that are like you. Why do you do that? Awkward. Um, I don't know. And Jesus is not saying that we cannot invite friends and family over. He's not saying, you know, don't go home and cancel your birthdays. That's not what Jesus is saying here. But he's saying this person, and, and what would happen is they would invite people so they would get invited back. And sometimes they would even invite people that were just a little lower than them so they could kind of have brownie points. They kind of thought that they were a good person. But they would never invite someone who was really low on the social ladder. They just wouldn't do that. And so Jesus says this. He says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So lesson three is service. We can serve others. Why can we serve others? We can serve others because Jesus first served us. Jesus served us, showing us what it means to, to lay down himself for us. And so even if you don't believe God, you take this to work tomorrow, and you serve those that can't serve around you, Man, it feels good. People around will notice. People will, will like you, even, even if you're not doing it for the right reasons. The reality, this works even if you don't believe in God. But the reality is, most of us probably know a situation that you've been in where you kind of feel like you don't belong. And Jesus cares about those people who feel like they don't belong. When we moved to Calgary a number of years ago, uh, my oldest son, he was in grade seven, we put him in a school, and he's a, he's a, he's a good kid. He, you know, he's athletic, he's, uh, you know, 
he's got everything going for him. And he was getting bullied. It got so bad that we actually pulled him out of the school and homeschooled him for four months. One day he came home and said, I go, so how was lunch? And, he, and basically he said that he was in the bathroom the whole lunchtime because he was scared to go outside. And he was getting bullied by girls who, who they would say, hey, we want you to come over and play with us. Come play soccer with us. And then he would come over and then they would make fun of him because he had no friends and they didn't want to play with him at all. And he told me this. And as a, as a parent, your heart breaks. Because maybe you experienced that. I experienced that in high school. I said, my son, my kids will never do, experience what I've experienced. I tell you that story because now um, he's back in, in the school he went, when he went to junior high or middle school. I ask him, so how are things going at school, Wyatt? He goes, what are you doing at lunchtime? Kind of a little scared of the answer because I, I don't want him to be hurt again. He goes, well, I spend the first half of my lunch hour going to talk to the kids that have no friends and I invite them to come in and be part of what I'm doing. And I go, you're a way better Christian than I am, kid. Because we had the conversation of why would God allow that to happen to him? And now he's taken that and he's turned this, I, I don't want kids to feel like that because I was pretty arrogant before. And so sometimes it's easy to invite the people that, we, that are going to be like us, the, the people that are, that are easy to love. And Jesus is saying, don't just invite the people that are easy to love. Invite the people that can never repay you. Do things for people that they will never, ever give you. Like, how many people have friends that you've lent money to or kids that you've lent money to? You're not getting the money back. It's okay. It's okay. But he, he talks about the poor. If you invite poor people to your house, they may steal stuff. If you invite people who are lame and crippled and blind, they may knock things over. They may smell. But Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. You will be repaid when? Look what he says. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the res resurrection of the just. See, there, there, there's an end coming. And so what I want to encourage you as you serve here, and especially those of you that have been here right from the beginning at Manifest, you've been serving and serving and serving. And sometimes you go like, I'm, maybe you've said it, and you, maybe you're too scared to even tell Pastor Brothers, but I'm tired. I want to quit. Why don't more people serve? It feels like I'm just doing this and nothing's happening, and I, I'm getting no reward. I want to encourage you, if that's you, that you are, that, that, that what you do does not go unnoticed. God sees that, and he will repay you one day. You don't do it for that reason, but you don't need to get repaid here. You will be repaid. So you serve. Why do you serve? Because Jesus first served you. Fourth awkward moment at the dinner party. Lesson four, verse 15. When one of those reclined at the table with him, he heard these things, and he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat the bread in the kingdom of God. He sits down and he goes, man, it's so good. It's going to be awesome in heaven. We're going to be just enjoying this great feast. And he was referring to Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9, where it talks about this great feast in heaven at the end of the age that everything will be made right and there will be no more tears and we gets picked up in Revelation. He goes, man, that's going to be great. And, uh, and Jesus says, um, well, actually, let me tell you a story. Another awkward moment. And he goes on to tell the story, and he says this. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. At the same time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Stop there. So what they would do in those days is they would have a banquet, and they would say, In the future, we're having a banquet on this day. Can you come? And you would say, Yes or no. So you would RSVP just like you would now. But they wouldn't say the time. And what would happen is the day of the banquet, the servant would go around and he would tell people what time the banquet was. And this is where the story, this is what Jesus is talking about. Here's the story. So they've committed to the banquet. So the person who's throwing the banquet is doing, throwing all the money in, and he needs to know how many people are there. So are we going to have chicken or are we going to you know, roast a cow? Like, what are, what are we doing? 
And so they needed to know. So he had a, an a accurate number. It's like when you're planning a wedding. Like, if you've ever planned a wedding, you need to know who's there, RSVP, and make sure that everybody's there. And then maybe you're one of the piece, persons that gets a, an invitation a week before the wedding, and they tell you that they forgot it or something, or it was lost in the mail, but the reality is you were on the B list, and then you actually got invited at the end because they needed to fill the seats. That's kind of what's going to happen here. Just follow me, verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. And the first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Well, if, if, if you've bought a field and you haven't seen it yet, you're not a very sharp business person. Like, really? You, you're going to go see the field. Now, you can afford the field, but you're not smart enough that you can actually see it beforehand. Lame excuse. Let's keep going. Verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I, I, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Really? You bought five yoke of oxen. So, ten oxes, okay? You're a rich landowner. You, if you need that many oxen for that much property, you have servants. You have people working for you. You don't have anybody that can go and see if they're going to work. And it's, this is late at night because the banquets were usually at night. And the people would not have time to even do that at night. Really? Lame excuse. Verse 20. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So this guy pulls the wife card. Yeah, the wife, she won't let me go. I got married. Well, when you accepted the invitation, you knew you just didn't get married quickly. You knew it was a long time. You, you knew you were getting married. And the reality in those days, the women weren't invited to the feast anyways. But he says, yeah, the wife won't let me. So this is what happens. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. And then the master of the house became angry, and he said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, you have commanded, has been done, and there's still room. So he says, Okay, the banquet's ready. We don't have enough people filled yet, so I want you to go out. So the servant goes out and begins to ask everybody. Pull the people that really shouldn't be here. Pull in the poor and the crippled, the lame and the blind. And I want to, because I want to serve them. He says, but, but master, we've done that and it's still not full. And so the master said, go to the servant, go to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that the house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. So he says, okay, it's not full. So go out and go out even further. And so he was referring to the, the lame and the crippled and the blind. They were probably Jewish people. And now he says, I want you to go even further. And I want you to bring in the people who usually weren't accepted at that time into the people of God. And then Jesus was doing a new thing because he was calling all people, not just Jews, but all people. He says, I want you to go to those, those places where people who, who you would think is scandalous to be accepted by me. Because the, the owner of the banquet is is representation for God. So he goes out and he begins to invite all of these people. And he compels them. Why does he compel them? So-and-so wants me, uh, but I'm, I'm not like him. I'm not like his social class. I don't have money. I'm, I'm, I'm very poor. I'm a Gentile. I wouldn't be welcome there. He says, no, you've got to compel, come in, come in, you're welcome. So he begins to invite everybody there. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. You see, so Jesus gives that invitation so they can hear the good news, so they can be invited into something that they, they just really don't deserve. You see, they would think, I'm, I shouldn't be here. Have you ever been invited to a place where you think you're not good enough to be there? That's the right attitude for coming into God's banquet. Like, I don't deserve it. This is just so good. It's too good to be true. So this morning, the last lesson that we have from this school of mission from this awkward dinner party where Jesus is, is bringing out truth that people need to hear. 
is a reality of acceptance. Number one, that Jesus was accepting you, that the landowner was, the person who was throwing the banquet was accepting anybody that wanted to come in. The invitation was out there. You as manifestors are, 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 are continually to invite people. You've got to come to our church. You've got to, you got to hear this good news. I want, to, I want to tell you about Jesus. And maybe that's why you're here, is because someone told you about what goes on. About this God who's compassionate, who, who loves you. But the reality is these people had to accept. The man that Jesus was telling this, this parable to thought that he was in. The people who were making those excuses thought that they were in. But the reality is is you can only enjoy the banquet if you accept the invitation. You have to accept when people go out and say, compel you to come. You've got to accept the invitation. And maybe this morning Jesus is, is here today compelling you to say, would you come? Would you come metaphorically to my banquet? Would you come and, and let me serve you? Would, you? would you let me feed you? Would you let me heal you? And see, some of us can make excuses. Well, I'm not ready to, to make that ex- decision yet. I've got this going on or that going on. There's lots of excuses. So I would encourage you this morning, if you've never accepted that invitation for Jesus to come and to take away your sins, to turn from the way you've lived before and to now say, I want to I live for Jesus. I would invite you to do that this morning, to say, I want to accept that invitation. It may seem too crazy because you go, maybe I, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the kind of person I've done. You don't know the things I've done. There's no way that I could be forgiven. I'm not worthy to go to the banquet. And yet here this morning, Jesus says, yes, you are. Why? Because he was worthy in your place. He lived a perfect life. And he went to the cross. And the penalty and the punishment that we deserved for our sin, he placed upon his own son, Jesus. And it says in Scripture that, that God took our sin, or Jesus took our sin, and he gave us his righteousness. So the only reason why you can come to the banquet is because Jesus paid the full price for you. When God looks at you, he sees his perfect son's righteousness. When you ask Jesus to forgive you. So there's no one here that can say, I'm too bad. I'm poor, I'm crippled, I'm lame, I'm blind, I can't come. And the reality is, is Jesus says, yes, you can, but you need to accept the invitation. And maybe you're here and you've already made that commitment. You said yes to Jesus. But maybe you you need to continue to accept the mission that he's given you. To continue to go out to the highways and to the hedges and to to tell people, you've got to come and you've got to tell people. Because isn't this news, the news of Jesus, it is amazing. It is good news. That's why it's called the gospel, good news. And I'm just talking to those of you who call this place Manifest Your Home, is I would encourage you to accept the call to mission, to accept the call to continue to go out and tell people to come. You've got to hear the good news. You don't deserve to be at a, at a great banquet, but he's, he's calling you to come. And it will change your life. And it will bring joy that you can never, never imagine. So I want to end with this. Awkward moments at a dinner party. We learned five lessons. We learned about compassion, that the compassion of God. We learned about humility, that we can be humble, that we don't need to push ourselves to the front, that we need to serve others. We don't need to be served because Jesus first served us. And there's an invitation, an invitation that goes out to join Jesus on his mission, but also to come to the banquet if you've never understood Jesus as your own personal Savior. And the fifth is acceptance. To accept the call, the invitation that you've been compelled to take. And so I want you to to pick one aspect this week. Is there one aspect that that you need to work on? You say, you know what, that hit me today and I want to work on this. Would you make a commitment to say, I want to work on this this week? Maybe it's that you don't believe that God is compassionate. And maybe you need to receive that compassion for yourself. 
Or maybe you need to humble yourself and say, you know what, I want to put others first. Man, this works great in a marriage if you always put your wife first. Works great at work when you put others first. I don't need to have everybody look at me when I'm serving people. Let it go. The invitation to be on mission and acceptance. And I'm asking you to pick one because men, women, you can maybe take more than one because you can do multitask. Us men, pick one. Where's God calling you this morning? Let me pray.